Last week, Tony Becker was in the Sierras driving the old mining trails in a classic Land Rover Discovery. Traveling with him, a group from Rover Accessories were determined on fly fishing the crystal blue lakes hidden in this little slice of heaven. But not every rig made the journey unscathed and there's still miles to go before they reach their final destination. Next on Four Wheeler TV. The Sierra mountain range is rich with stories of lost treasures and hidden historical trails, many of which allow some light vehicle use by special permit. It's just this kind of adventure that attracted us. Here's Tony Becker for the story. There's not much that can compare with the beauty and tranquility of the Eastern Sierras. Each change in elevation meant new obstacles in our path from loose rock to narrow switchbacks, but the Land Rovers were tough. We arrived at base camp at sunset the first night and Charles DeAndre of Rover Accessories made sure we stuck on schedule. We still had several more days of wheeling and fishing ahead, another trail to climb, another lake to discover. Nothing beats an early mountain morning. Take a deep breath and exhale. The air is crisp, the sunlight is sharper, even the tiny bubbling stream is inspirational. Yeah. I guess you could say I was really glad to be back in the Sierras. That's how it was the morning of our second day. We were in essence in search of the Sierras well-hidden trails and even more elusive golden trout. However, no matter how pleasing the day promised to be that morning, not everyone seemed to be eager to get out of their tents after a late night of setting up base camp. You know, <clears throat> sometimes it's so beautiful when you're back to nature that these guys just want to sleep in. <laughs> we can't get them up. As camp cook Brian Pringle found out, if there is one thing that'll get a bunch of wannabe mountain men out of hibernation, it's bacon. For some reason, food just tastes better outdoors. We got bacon up. Who wants bacon? I'll do it. Come on, Larry. Come on, Larry. Yep. We had to hike up to the first of two lakes and everyone was pumped up at the prospect of catching these prized golden trout. However, it wasn't long before the conversation shifted to the new Land Rover LR3. With 300 horsepower under the hood, the 4.4 liter LR3 had no trouble driving the trails or traversing the rock ledges. Yet. It's just that good. The LR3 is equipped with full-time four-wheel drive. It has a six-speed electronically controlled automatic transmission and a unique command shift and terrain response dynamic system. What this all means is there's just not much to stop this rig from doing its thing. At least, not yet. You have the creature comforts of leather seats, voice recognition navigation system, a 14 speaker audio system, and you've got an all-round SUV. The LR3 hadn't let us down one iota, but we had a long way to go and some rocky trails. The LR3 had lots of cargo room, and with the full camera crew in tow, it served as our location rig. Before I could even choke down a cup of coffee, the guys from Rover Accessories had already hightailed it up a hiking trail to a small lake that was rumored to have its share of golden trout. Hidden lakes like these are all over the U.S., 
What makes this one so special is you can literally drive so close to its shoreline and you can do this with peace of mind that the trails were put there for that purpose. As a wheeler, I didn't know fly fishing was so complex. From float tubes to pontoon boats to just about every rod and reel you could think of. See, it just so happens that this Charles guy tests adventure gear for various companies like Colorado Creek. That would explain his king-size fishing wardrobe. Is that mainly, that's, so that's going to dive into the water, it's not going to be... Yeah, we got it on a uh, sinking tip. So what's going to happen, he'll be sitting out in that float tube casting out to deeper fish. The bigger fish will be sitting out there. And that thing's going to just throb back and those little flash flashes on the side should get their attention. Now I just tied a standard clinch knot on it. It's the standard knot that we'll be using for the flies for the weekend. And we'll also be using the uh, dry flies on the surface, some of these smaller fish that are sitting up there. And I think the lucky one's gonna be this ant. It's got an orange indicator on it so you can see it when it goes down. One might think that by the time these guys get their gear together, these fish are gonna be packed up and gone. Well, I grew up fly fishing up here in the Sierras. My grandfather used to take me up like every month and uh, in the summertime, so we'd start coming up fly fishing. He, I was just a little tyke, he put a fly rod in my hand and no clue what I was doing. But after taking to the peacefulness of it, I grew a liking to coming up to the Sierras and I get up here as often as I can. And what I'm using here is a sinking. It's called a Type 3 sinking line and it's at kind of a medium to aggressive sink rate. I'm fishing about 10 to 15. There we go, got one on. I'm trying to fish about 10 to 15 feet of water. Yeah, that's a little one. It's a nice one. I don't like to play these fish for too long. I want to tire them out, get them in shot. Try to bring them up. These smaller fish I like to bring up to the boat pretty quickly. Grab my net and release them all within. And also another thing, when, when releasing fish, use a, use a net like this that allows you just to put it in the water, turn them over, and let them go. Now there was a small brook trout about eight inches. Inflatables gave these guys access to deeper water, and access means going where the fish hang out. But I'll tell you what, another tried and true way to get your line in the water is from shore. Kevin McNulty is the editor of Four Wheel Drive Sport Utility Magazine, and he is no stranger to outdoor adventures. Unlike the rest of these guys, Kevin actually didn't grow up fly fishing. He learned about it from a book he bought. He spent two months traveling parts of Colorado, Wyoming, and Montana, getting better acquainted with the nuances of the sport. You might say he's been hooked ever since. This is magical out here. It's hard to even think. Oh, it's spectacular. It's so nice to be out here in beautiful country like this and just relax and forget the day-to-day -day grind. Yeah, I don't, and I don't think many people know that they can get out here in their vehicles and they can find this place. That is another fish. Well, <laughs> that's one of the finer points of having a four-wheel drive vehicle to get out here. You know? People that don't own a four-wheel drive will never see places like this. And these are what you've been bringing in? These, these little rainbows? Yeah, yeah, a little rainbow? A little, little brookie. He looks like 
He's uh There you go. This is a this is a wonderful way to spend an afternoon. Bagel. It's fantastic, man. Really great. Kevin put it in perspective for me. One big reason to own a four-wheel drive is to get to locations like this, where it's so quiet you can hear a pine cone drop a hundred yards away. I left Kevin alone to his fishing. The Goldens were biting and I didn't want to take him out of the moment. You know, whether or not Charles and his buddies will admit it, it was clear to me that there was more to this trip than just catching fish and running trails. The serenity of these mountains and their incredible beauty certainly has the power to harmonize life. Maybe that's why Tibetan monasteries are on mountaintops. I once said to Scoop Vessels that I had a spiritual relationship to the Sierras. He laughed at me. Four-wheeler trivia. There's no denying that the Land Rover Defender looks like Great Britain's answer to the U.S. Army's Jeep. But do these luxury SUVs really have a World War II pedigree? The answer when we return. Unlike the American-made Jeep, the original Land Rover was developed in 1947 as a farm vehicle. It was, however, quickly adopted by the British Army as a do-everything, go-anywhere four-wheel drive truck. Land Rover's upscale division, Range Rover, was first introduced in 1970. On the other side of this small lake, some of the Rover boys had been fishing for several hours, and it seemed like a good time to check out the Defender 110 on our own. Something you are very unlikely to see on the trail is the Defender 110. As used rigs go, these are in demand and they carry a steep price tag. With its distinctive external roll cage, the Defender wagon is ready to take on the Mongolian plains as easily as it has the Sierra Mountains. Only 500 Land Rover Defender 110 wagons like this one were imported into the United States and only in 1993. Membership into this relatively small club will set you back about $75,000. It's a lot of money. Brett Carnot, the owner of the Defender, he's made some pretty practical modifications to it. All right, so the AC unit right there, this is an add-on, and that's uh, like 16,000 BTUs. So the same size uh, that the Greyhound bus uses, but it's a special, more compact model. All right, then I have the uh, refrigerator here, which is a uh, ARB fridge, and that of course has freezer mode as well. All right, so I got the rear backup light, you know, it just makes a big deal, you know, coming into a tight spot like this. Um, seven gallons of fresh water right here. So wash your hands or, you know, do whatever. That's uh, for my dog, basically. Uh, special tinted windows, so like 90% of the light is uh, reflected. While this Defender wagon is a rarity, it is not the only Defender with us in the Sierras. Rover Accessories specially built a 110 Defender crew cab appropriately called the Fly Fisher, and it is a tough trail rig. This rig was built on a military spec Defender chassis imported from Great Britain. It's equipped with a 3.9 liter V8 coupled to a ZF automatic transmission. A few extras include an oversized fuel tank and a 55 liter water tank, two essentials for venturing into the backcountry. So we're gonna go to another lake today. I guess it's gonna be better wheeling going in. Be fun. I don't know, we go into Bishop for an hour and then two hours out of there? It'll be nice. After a few days here, it was time to break camp and head down the mountain trail to Highway 395, leading to our next adventure. We headed due north toward Mammoth Lakes. These trails were so remote, you can't even find them on a map. The Discovery 2 had so far been nothing but pleasant. It was just as comfortable on the trail as it was on the highway, and to be honest, guys, I was starting to feel a little guilty. The thing I liked the best was the Red Bull dispenser in the center. All in all, the Discovery 2 was a capable, comfortable rig. After a quick stop for fuel and supplies, we followed Charles north. The next few trails would challenge us a bit more. In fact, we decided not to risk putting the other Discovery 2 through it. We left it at the base of the trailhead. A faulty solenoid in the transmission meant it had no low-range four-wheel drive. 
and these climbs get too steep and rocky to push it. If you ever get a chance to drive these trails, take it. You don't need much. A capable rig, a good attitude, and some common sense. You know, remember the basic rules. Stay on designated trails, pack out what you pack in, and leave it as beautiful as you found it. It's not the boardroom table, we're in the clear. Now for the Skyjacker Shock of the Day. From the top truck's strange clip files comes this little jump. Despite some bad luck in the infamous tank trap, Team Fordzilla decides they'd rather be rafting down the water obstacles than driving up them. Watch out for the Whitecaps. It was becoming clear that nothing was going to stop the Land Rovers. Even the heavy trailer did nothing to slow down the LR3. Speaking of trailers, this trailer made by Campa, it had everything including the kitchen sink. Once again, Charles' knowledge of the back roads granted us striking panoramas. It was like being on another continent a hundred years in the past. We had to remind ourselves that we were only a few hours off the U.S. interstate. As the road snaked further into the back country, the lush green meadows grew into steep arching hillsides. The road turned from teeth jarring boulders to loose gravel. The view, spectacular. Goldens or not, getting the opportunity was worth the effort. The only thing to do was to leave this wilderness as we found it, safeguarding the right to be on these trails hopefully for years to come. We would again reach the very tops of these mountain trails to our next base camp. The wind had increased and the temperature had dropped dramatically. Then, Charles' secret fishing lake was below, and it looked like a precious piece of jade gracefully wedged into the bottom of the canyon. It was only a matter of finding our footing down the precarious trail. We reached camp by late afternoon and the sun had already fallen behind the ridge. Unlike the previous night, we were camping lakeside, which was beyond beautiful, more like indescribable. The only drawback to trailers is finding the right spot to set them up. The camp a trailer had to be leveled. After all, it was our kitchen for the remainder of the week. Sand area down below. I was thinking that's where the, the tent, tent guys can Stay. Well, well, and then you have this fire pit right here. Okay, well how about how about this? We put the trailer there because it's got the sand and we use the lower fire pit as a fire pit. Okay. For us, camping lakeside required some ingenuity and care. We didn't want to tread on anything that would upset the ecosystem. You know, and we lucked out to find this huge fire ring, which really was nice since it was 10 or 20 degrees colder here than our previous campsite. The wind really whipped up through this canyon. This lake was in a giant basin, surrounded by towering pines and low-lying sage. The rock cliffs around us were most likely etched away by early mining efforts, uncovering a burnt orange hue of mineral deposits. Maneuvering the larger-than-life camp a trailer into the flattest ground possible turned out to be a bit more complicated, but we managed to get it done. After all, this was our only supply wagon. Well, we can put one rock under here and get it level. It'll be perfect. Well, we got some more moving to do yet. Rob, Rob stop. All right. A few words about camping in areas like this. Don't assume anything. Check for posted signs indicating any closed areas. There are a lot of tree seedlings and other natural plants that are not easily seen, so have somebody get out and help you maneuver your vehicle. A good spotter will help guide you into position, clear rocks and other things. That's how it's done. We want to come back to the beauty we left. Back up. We're good right here, are we? You're not level. You're you want to see well, we're going to have to chalk yeah. it up anyway. I'm not sleeping on this. No. Here. Put, put your right hand up. Bring this wheel right on this puff here. If you need to ask why we're being so cautious, well, maybe this type of camping is just not for you. There are a lot of areas that are less complicated and fragile. 
for us, we would do anything to be in here, even if it takes hours of just setting up camp. And believe me, it did. Now by this time, everyone was itching to go fly fishing. Charles once again assured us that this was the lake that the Goldens would be popping. Now, so far these fish have outsmarted us from day one. So maybe we're not quite the fly fishermen that we thought. Then again, maybe I should just speak for myself since I was having a better time just admiring the mountains and walking around with my dog, Theo. I suppose we all hoped that tomorrow this elusive golden trout would just jump into our nets. Well, somehow, none of us really expected that to happen. To tell you the truth, it really didn't matter. All I wanted to do was just sit back and take in this view. trails ahead next week the conclusion of in search of goldens for everyone at four-wheeler tv i'm bob bauer saying tread lightly <laughs>